Vamos a poner en oración en nombre del Padre, del Hijo, del Espíritu Santo. Amén. Esta clase enfoca en María y la Eucaristía. Así que vamos a rezar un Dios te salve a la Virgen. Dios te salve, Rey y Madre. Madre de misericordia. Mira la gloria y la esperanza nuestra. Dios te salve, María. 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 Dios Bendito del vientre, por nuestra madre de Dios, para que la de la Amén. Te damos gracias, Santa María, por haber aceptado el llamado de ser la madre de nuestro Salvador. Te damos gracias por quedarte con nosotros y te damos gracias por aceptar la misión y llamarnos a cada momento en que tu pueblo esté en dificultad. Te damos gracias por esas apariciones guadalupana, en Pátima, en Lourdes, en todos lados, Señora, porque te ha hecho presente para enseñarnos y para decirnos, hagan lo que Él les diga. Enséñanos, María. Nuestra Santa Madre, a obedecer a Cristo y a decir como tú, nosotros somos esclavos del Señor, que se hagan nosotros según tu palabra. Bendita tú eres entre todas las mujeres y bendito es el fruto de tu vientre, Jesús. Bendito es Dios, Padre de Dios, ruega por nosotros, pecadores, ahora y la hora de nuestra muerte. Amén. Bendice, Padre. Jesús Cristo, Rey del Universo. A cada uno de los que estamos aquí, a los que están en Zoom, bendícelos, Señor Jesús, para que se gocen de la presencia tuya y aprendan, Padre Santo, ese, esa conexión, ese enlace entre tú, María, el primer sagrario y la salvación que viene a través de tu Hijo, nuestro Señor Jesucristo. Bendice al Padre Mark en la presentación que él va a hacer hoy. Y te le pedimos, Padre Santo, que él sea guiado por tu Espíritu Santo y que las palabras que salgan de la boca de él sean palabras tuyas, que tú lo instruiste y que utilices esa instrucción para extender tu reino aquí en el cielo. Te damos gracias, Padre Santo, por todo lo que hemos recibido de ti, que eres Dios y Virgen por los siglos de los siglos. Amén. Pueden sentarse. Yo no sé cuántos de ustedes conocen a Padre Mark Stout. Él trabaja aquí en el colegio y es el, el director de este de, de espiritual de, 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 de aquí del colegio. Y siempre que sabe que estamos aquí busca la manera de hacerse presente y, y ver cómo nosotros hacemos nuestra misión. A él lo recomendó el mismo obispo para que diera esta charla. Y estamos agradecidos del obispo por ayudarnos a establecer los, los títulos, los cursos, el contenido de este curso. Y le damos gracias por recomendar muy buenos oradores. Sabemos que la semana pasada, Padre Gary Daly tiró las puertas por la ventana. Y para aquellos que faltaron, que no pudieron venir, esas dos enseñanzas, lo mejor que pude hacer fue poner las traducciones con el Padre Gary hablando. Están en YouTube, en el, en el canal de YouTube que se llama, en, en, con arroba, Pedro J. Rivera Morán, 725. Pueden encontrarlo y yo le voy a mandar a todos ustedes, les voy a pedir a Lucy que me dé la lista de distribución de todos los que han venido, que yo no tengo los emails todavía, para que toda la semana le envíe. Este, el, el canal de YouTube de la enseñanza estamos tratando de grabarlas todas y que puedan aprovecharla, pueden repasarla pueden revisarla de aquí a seis meses, ¿qué es lo que dijo el Padre sobre esto? la pueden escuchar eh, así que vamos a comenzar I'm very happy to, to be here with you today uh, uh, 
mention Deacon Pedro mentioned that I'm here at the Elms. Um, I came here at the Elms and I began to teach here when I was just 28 years old. And the president of the college at that time, Sister Mary Dooley, said, we need you to teach just for six weeks in a summer course. And she told the bishop, we just need to borrow him for six weeks. <laughs> so that six weeks has become 38 years wow. that, that I'm here teaching. But the wonderful thing in my life as a priest is that in addition to being here at the college uh, teaching for all these years, I've always been working in a parish, and even before I was ordained a priest and came here to teach, um, as a seminarian, I worked in the Spanish Apostolate uh, back in the days in Springfield, when we had Spanish Apostolate, Apostolado Hispano, in Springfield, Holyoke, and Westfield. And as seminarians, there would be 12 or 13 or 14 of us teaching and preparing the kids during the summer uh, for First Communion. So I mentioned uh, that some of you obviously uh, were able to pick up what I said. I'll speak slowly in English, but I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I've been at the college for 38 years teaching here. I even taught Deacon Pedro when he was studying to be a deacon. So all of the wonderful deacons in your parish, um, I taught them here at the Elms. They come here for four years and do really hard work and really good work here. And that's been one of the great joys of my priesthood. And one of the wonderful things that I had the opportunity to do um, as a seminarian is to work for three years at Sagrado Corazón with the Spanish Apostle, Apostolado Hispano, in the days of Father Kennedy and other people like that that were there, Deacon Hinaro was a deacon then, and we would prepare young people for the sacraments during the summer, seminarians and sisters who were at Sacred Heart. And we had a wonderful time doing that, and each summer, at Sacred Heart, at the end of the summer in August, you would have First Communion for about 250 kids that would come just from that parish. <coughs> then there would be another First Communion from Casa Maria in Holyoke, There'd be another First Communion there and also in Westfield. And that's where I first began to work with the uh, Latino community and that's been part of my ministry off and on through the years. And just a couple of years ago, um, many of you are here uh, from Holyoke where I worked with the sisters. Um, I was at St. Jerome's and then when we merged that, brought it together with Guadalupe and the Macalada and the Platts. I was there as a priest that did that. And I'm in Hamden now in a very small place for an old man like me. Uh, but I miss I miss being with the Latino community. And a lot of times in Hamden I'm looking out there, they're all people that look just like me. Huh? They're very nice people. Most of them my age, we're getting a lot of younger people that are coming, college age kids that I know, but I really miss the diversity, I miss the music. Uh, I miss being able to say Mass in Spanish with my bad Spanish, but I always had my deacon with me, Deacon Alberto, many of you know, and Deacon Jose Carrera. Uh, they were big helps to me there, so I'm happy to do this. I studied Spanish in college. Uh, I studied in high school, but I haven't spoken it for a long time, so I can read it, I can pretty much write it. So these slides are in Spanish and in English for you, and we will ask uh, after this is done, to have them sent to you so that you can have all the slides to put in your nice notebooks that you have here today. So we're going to talk about Mary and the Eucharist, but we have to remember why we're talking about Mary uh, specifically today as part of this course on the Eucharist. It's because we are in a year of the Eucharist, and you've learned a lot about that already in your parishes. Uh, you learned a little bit about that from Father Gary Daly, that we are part of what the bishops in the United States ask to be part of, of a Eucharistic revival, coming to a deeper appreciation of the presence of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. So I'm going to begin with just a short video clip to sort of set the tone for us. It's in Spanish, and I'm going to turn this off so you can see the screen better. And also, if you want to sleep, you can sleep a little bit better. So we're going to just look at this to, uh, to begin with. 
En la jornada de nuestra vida, mientras buscamos propósito y conexión, somos llamados. Llamados a poner nuestra fe y confianza en algo más grande que nuestro propio entendimiento. Somos llamados por alguien que ya nos ama y se ofrece a nosotros. Jesucristo. Su cuerpo dado por nosotros. Su sangre derramada diariamente. Nunca caminamos solos en la vida. A través de la Eucaristía nos encontramos con su presencia real y con otros que comparten nuestra fe. Juntos nos convertimos en uno con Él en su misma carne. Y cuando llevamos su presencia al mundo, podemos ser luz para los demás. Este es el llamado del Evangelio a ser discípulos de todas las naciones, dando nuestras vidas por los demás, como Él lo hizo por nosotros. Ahora es el momento, unir nuestros corazones con el Suyo por la vida del mundo. This is the moment, huh? Ahora es el momento, huh? To unite ourselves to Jesus in the Eucharist and continue to grow in this wonderful sacrament that we call the body and the blood of Christ. And tonight what we're going to spend time doing is looking at the relationship of Mary to Jesus and the church, Jesus and the Iglesia, and to the Eucharist, Eucharistia, okay? And we're going to talk about her today as a Eucharistic woman. Mujer Eucaristica. That is what she is. Can everybody say that with me? Mujer Eucaristica. You can say it better in Spanish tonight. That's what we are celebrating, that woman today. And we want to go back, and I don't speak long. Pedro will tell you when I used to teach the deacons at like because they got to go home early. So I'm not going to talk long, but I'm going to give you a lot to think about. And I want you to go back to think with me back to the 1950s before most of you were born. And we're going to talk a little bit about this thing that we've all heard about growing up called Vatican II. You've heard about Vatican II in these courses. Okay, and we're going to talk a little bit about this document called Lumen Gentium, that's a Latin word, for light of the nations, huh? La luz, Cristo es la luz. And that was one of 16 documents that came out from Vatican II. So I'm going to tell you the story about that. And again, these slides are in Spanish and also in English, so... I think you can follow pretty well with me if I get my big fat body out of the way. I'm going to see how many screens. So we begin talking about Juan Bente Face. And we all know he was a great man. We have the movement in our parishes, Juan Bente Face. And it's young people. You know, my friend Nestor, you know him? He plays a guitar, toca la guitarra. Nestor Chevere. He teaches chemistry here too sometimes. He sings at all. He's a great leader in this movement. They have Juan Ventitre's movement, so great St. Anthony's and Willa Manson, I know. And maybe some of your parishes. Anybody part of it? Juan Ventitre? Yeah, good. So John the 23rd was a man named Angelo Roncalli. That was the name his mother and father gave him. And he was born in the late 1800s, a long time ago, even before I was born. Okay. He was born in the late 1800s. And he was retired. He had become a cardinal in the church. And he was a very well-educated man. He had gone to study after he was a priest even more. And he was a diplomat for the Vatican. So instead of being in a diocese, they would send him to a country like Turkey or a country in Africa. And he would be the Pope's representative in those countries. Like we have one in this country. He's called the Apostolic Delegate. And he's the Pope's connection to Rome, and if Bishop Newman doesn't like something I do and he wants to get me in more trouble, he calls the Apostolic Delegate. Huh? 
then the delegate can call the Pope, right? That's how it works. The bishops report to him about everything going on in the country. So that's what he did most of his priesthood as a cardinal. And then he retired, like most of us do eventually. And in 1958, he was already retired, living in retirement, helping out saying masses and doing nice things that retired cardinals do. <coughs> and what happened is the Pope at that point, whose name was Pius XII, died. And he had been Pope for a very long time, all during World War II, during Hiroshima, very sad things. He was the Pope when all those people were being killed in Germany and all of those things. So it came, 1958, he died, he was a very old man, and they said the cardinals came together to elect a new pope. And Angelo Roncalli was there as one of the cardinals. And they said, we need to get a new pope in here. I think the chair's across the hall. So they said, we need to get a new pope. So the cardinals came together in 1958, and they began to vote. And you had to get two thirds majority plus one to win the election. So they kept saying to themselves, who can we get as a young cardinal that can help us address a lot of the challenges in the modern world? Things like, what is the church going to say in the face of nuclear war, which was just beginning to come? What are we going to say you know, after Hiroshima? What's the morality of that? Can we say any war is just anymore because of that? They began to ask, to ask themselves questions about things like birth control. Uh, suddenly science was telling us an awful lot about how our bodies work. And so a lot of ethical questions began to be asked. And even in 1958, they said the world is changing. Just a few years later, people would land on the moon in the early 60s. So the world was changing. They said, we need a young person you know, to sort of help the church stay in tune with the modern world. But they kept voting and voting and voting and couldn't find somebody. So they finally said, we ought to go back home and get back to work. We can't be over here alone. You know, we've got to go back to work. So they said, let's just get somebody old to be nice to the people. And in the meantime, they said, We'll get some young cardinals elected. So when that old man we elect gets sick or dies, we'll be able to have a younger cardinal that we can come back and vote in a year or so for. So they elected this man called Juan Vendetres. He took the name. When you become a pope, you change your name. And he chose that name. So he was elected pope in 1958. And... Just it was elected in October, and by January 1959, he went to left Christmas. He announced plans. He said, I'm going to call a council to renew the church, to get us back to our sources, our original sources, at the time of Jesus, what it was like to be early Christians, and also to help us move toward the future, to bring renewal to the church. And when he called the council, Everybody, even the cardinals that were around, thought he had gone crazy. They said, you know, this little old man, he ain't go, huh? I said, how's he going to start a council? He's not going to live long enough to see it finished, huh? He's not going to have the energy to do this. So they said, even the cardinals looked at each other and... They didn't have the word back, but they thought maybe he has Alzheimer's or something. Not to mention. They didn't know. But he knew exactly what he was going to do. And his announcement was met with stunned silence. Now the cardinals weren't going to tell him no. Oh. <laughs> so they went along with it. So what he did is he suggested two guiding principles for the council. A giornamento, which is a word for bringing the church up to date, up to speed to today. And what he called the French word for sorcement getting us back to the way it was at the time of Jesus. Like he said, at the time of Jesus, he said the first Pope, St. Peter, wasn't sitting up on a throne and all of that and being like carried on a chair like they used to carry the Pope and all that. He said it was much more humble. He said back at the time of the early disciples, they didn't have these big cathedrals to worship in. They sat around the table and blessed bread and broke it together in their homes. So he said, we need to remember where we came from. And he said at the same time, we need to bring the church up to speed and 
answer some of these questions that they are asking us. So it took about three years just to get ready for it. <coughs> the bishops had a talk before they came together, all the bishops of the world, and then just the cardinals. About 3,000 bishops were there. And the last time they had a council was back in 1869, Vatican I, almost 100 years before. And at that council, there were fewer than 500 bishops there. This one, there's 3,000 bishops. And what's the difference? People could fly to get there in 1962. So like, the bishops of the United States, half of them didn't get to the council. Vatican I. It was over by the time they got word by a telegram that it was starting. <laughs> so it's much more representative. So it opened on the stage, 3,000 bishops, and it, they would meet each year from October until December. They did this for four years. But at the end of 1962, <coughs> after the first session was over, he died. So they did have to come back and elect that younger person, that younger leader. And that's when they elected the guy below him, Pablo Cesa, Paul VI. So he came after. And together, these men worked together with the beginning of John the 23rd, and then the young man to come after him to put this council in action and First thing Paul VI said, the council must continue. So we can't lose anything of the momentum. We've got to keep this old man's vision alive. And the council is going to produce 16 documents. And we could spend an entire course on each of the 16 documents. And I teach courses like that here, but I'm not going to do that in one hour, an hour and a half with you. We're just going to look at one that's going to give us some insight and to marry a woman of the Eucharist. So this Constitution on the Church, that's the Latin name of it. This is the Constitution de Latica sobre la Iglesia. Going to ask a couple questions. Who are you, Church of Christ? Who do you say you are? And the bishops gather together and say, we really got to ask ourselves, who are we today? What is the Church? We have to get rid of all this stuff, all these trappings that have kept us from being true to what Jesus wants us to be. That we've gotten further and further from being the church of simple love that Jesus intended. So, Vatican II met these years, 62 to 65, 16 documents, and the question they asked themselves when they were getting to write this constitution on the church and write all of the 16 documents, should we have a separate document on Mary? They listed all the documents they were going to write about. Things like the liturgy or the mass, the Santa Misa. There's a document on that. A document about bishops, or bishops. They wrote a document on that. They wrote a document about priests. Huh? They wrote a document about nuns, sisters and brothers. Huh? They wrote a document about that. They wrote a document about modern communication, like the importance of translating things today for people who don't understand in the language, because not everybody could speak Latin if they were speaking. So they wrote a document on communications. How do we make the most of media? They said, should we write a separate document on Mary? And they answered no. Not because she's not important, but because they said she has to be considered as part of the church. Right in the document, she's that important that we can't talk about Mary unless we talk about two things, Christ and the church. That we talk and honor Mary only because of her special relationship with Jesus and the church. Everything we say about her points to Christ and the church. So they said, let's talk about her in this document on the church to show how important she is. And that was the decision they made back in the early 60s before this other document came out, Lumen Gentium, in 1964. So she becomes the last, and some people would say, a significant chapter in the book. Sometimes when people are writing a book, a good novel writer, they'll say the best chapter to last to keep your attention. 
for the last chapter in this document, you can go online and look for it, and you can read it in Spanish. They're all translated. And when I say a document, it's not that many pages. Maybe 60 pages. And about maybe of those 60 pages, maybe 8 or 9 or 10 are on Mary. So no, just be the church. So this is the Constitution Dogmatica sobre la Iglesia. It's want to ask the question, Church of Christ, who are you? Who are you? You know, we've just taken for granted who we are. But who are we? And they're going to answer it, trying to do two things. To look back to all of our resources, where we came from, the French word, the source of all. And also ask that question in light of, well, who are you today in light of the world that's out there, the real world? And we're not just a church that can hide in the sacristy anymore, huh? We're not just a church that hides in the convent anymore. We're not just a church that hides in the rectory anymore. When I was growing up, you never saw the priest except on the weekend, huh? When I was growing up in school, the sisters after they taught school went home to their convent. You never saw them until the next day at school. You know, they weren't out. But now we said the church needs to be a church in the world. So we need to say, Church of Christ, who are you in light of the modern world? And they also were going to ask the question, what can we say about Mary in light of about what the scriptures tell us, the sources, and a lot about how does she speak to modern people today? How does she speak to modern people today? So this document on the church went through a lot of revisions. They started working on it in 1962, October to December. They went home, they came back the next October, 63 to 64, they worked on it. And at the end of 1964, they had the document ready in its final form. The first draft of it was very juridical. It began, chapter one was about the Pope. So he wanted to say, Church of Christ, who are you? We'll start with the Pope. Then we'll talk about the bishops. Then we'll talk about the priests. Then about the sisters. And then lay people were way down at the bottom. Huh? And a lot of the thinkers at the council, brilliant priests and brilliant young bishops, they said, no, no, no. That's not the church Christ intended. That we are all in this one as the people of God, pueblo de Cristo, huh? Because of baptism. That the most important thing I can tell you about myself that I share with you is not that I'm different because I'm a priest. We begin by talking about what makes us one. Juntos, enlazados, baptismo, huh? That sacrament. So it was very higher article. Higher article. The final draft began talking about the universal call to holiness that is shared by all people. They said that's where we need to start. That common call of baptism. And they even took the radical move of saying in this document and others that even people who aren't Catholic and aren't Christian are still called somehow to be part of the church that Christ has a love for them too. They might not be active members in the church, but God's love is there for them too. Now, I'm 66, but when I was a little boy, there was a Protestant church across the street from my house, and my grandmother, not my mother, but my grandmother would always say, you can't go in that church because it's Protestant. Catholics don't go in there. They're not saved, huh? You know, because they're, they're not Catholic, no heaven for them. So Vatican II is saying we have to begin about thinking that differently. When we talk about the church, we need to be able to say it's a church for everyone. Now some people, like ourselves, are baptized, active in the church. But Vatican II wanted to say that even for those who aren't, they have a part in the church. So the Constitution on the Church's document begins to say that it's known as Lumen Gentium, that's what it's known as, and the basic translation in Spanish would be the light of the nations. And it begins with the sentence, Christus est, 
Cristo es la luz de las naciones. Cristo es la luz de las naciones. Okay, so there were many So this is what it looked like, the outline. It began by talking about the mystery of the church, where everybody is welcome. It didn't begin talking about the Pope, but the bishop. Talked about this mystery of the church, everyone is welcome. It began talking about the people of God who are part of that church, everyone. Okay? Then it talked about the structure. It said because we didn't have the structure, it wouldn't work, huh? We didn't have a bishop. If we didn't have pastors and we have deacons, there wouldn't be order to the church. If we didn't have catechists like yourself, there wouldn't be order in the church. We need some order too. So they talked about that. Then they talked about the importance of the laity, not way down at the bottom, but the vocation that married people have, that single people have, who aren't priests or sisters or deacons in the church, that their vocation is very special, their vocation in the world. The universal call to holiness for all of us they stress. They talked about religious, the sisters and the religious brothers. Then it talked about the church as being on a pilgrim journey home. It said what we have in the church is just temporary, huh? That the goal of the church is to bring us home to heaven. That's our home until we get to our final home. And then in the end, when it's talking about our final home, like they said sometimes they save a very significant chapter until the end to keep your attention. That's where they said we have to talk about Mary, huh? The Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, in light of her relationship to the mystery of Christ and the mystery of the church. Because what was happening before Vatican II, and maybe a little bit after too, until people began to learn about Vatican II, is that Mary was almost becoming like a fourth person of the Trinity. A lot of people almost like worshipped her. And they forgot that the only reason we have devotion to Mary is because she's related to Christ, the mother of Jesus, and because she is the mother of the church, that we just don't worship her as a god. So they said we have to be able to say that we need to look at the role of Mary in light of her relationship to Christ and the church. And as we're going to see here, Another document will come on later and say that anything we say about Mary, we have to make certain that what we are saying about her, even the mysteries of her life, like the virginal conception, that's important because it points to Christ. Huh? The fact of the immaculate conception, that she was conceived without sin from the first one of her. We say that's important because it's pointing to the fact that God wanted somebody free from sin to be able to say a total yes to God. It wasn't just to be able to say, Mary, out of all these women, you're going to be the fourth God or the fourth person of the Trinity. Everything we say about Mary, every honor we give her, has to point back to Christ and therefore to the church. So, if anybody needs the English, here it is. And again, you're going to get all these slides. So, you'll be able to have them to go home and study and get bored with it nice and night. Okay? So, here's chapter 8 on Mary. And have the English and Spanish side by side. So, it begins with an introduction. Saying what I just said. That it is very important always when we talk about Mary to make sure that we're talking about her in relationship to two things, Christ and the church. Then begins talking about the importance of Mary, this is the title of it, in the history of salvation. That Mary stands in a long line of people who lived before Jesus. You know, she was a Jewish woman. And we can trace all of her relatives. We know about her cousin Elizabeth and Elizabeth's parents. And we can trace all the way back. Mary, they said that Mary stands in a long line of people that people like the prophet Isaiah, long before Jesus was born, 
predicted would give birth to a savior. The Isaiah, we say that in Advent, we read about that. A virgin shall conceive a son, and you will name him Emmanuel. That's not something that came up two days before Jesus was born. Huh? That was way out there with Isaiah. That Mary isn't somebody who just came out at the last minute in time for the first Christmas. And nine months before Jesus was born, say, guess what? Out of nowhere, you're it. She, she was promised up for these centuries, and the people waited, and finally it came true. So she doesn't come out of nowhere. It's important. She's been just as John the Baptist was foretold, just as Jesus was foretold. And yet she was foretold. And it talks about Mary's relationship to the church. They say things like, just as she was mother to Jesus and cared for him and nurtured him and at times cried for him and at times laughed with him, that Mary is the mother of the church and she does the same thing for each of us today, that she is our mother. She's our mother too. And she laughs with us as she did with Jesus. She cries with us as she did with Jesus. She has dreams for us, as any mother has for her child. Mary wants the best for us. That's why we pray for her to receive for us. That she does the same things for us that she did for that little child, that little boy she held in her hand, and that young adult whose cross she stood before. And knew suffering and accepted it, knowing that God's plan had to be there. Any of you who are mothers, religious sisters know that same feeling of what it is to have that motherly care, huh? Never get between a mom and her kid, right? No? Never. Same way with Mary, huh? This is my boy, right? And she'll do everything to protect him, even Joseph, huh? But she always at Joseph. Where was he? Lost him in the temple, right? And you tell him, your fault, huh? Yeah. And how Joseph had to say, yes, my fault, right? Go along with it. And then it said, how are we going to worship Mary? It suggests we, we want to continue to pray to Mary, and we need to pray to Mary, but we've got to make sure that people know that when we're praying to her, it's not like some people were thinking back in the 50s and the 60s, your parents and my grandparents. It's not almost like making her a god. Huh? You know, for some people, it was more important to go worship Mary before a statue than to receive communion. And that, that's really not right, huh? That Eucharist is more important, that we were making her almost more important than Jesus and the church and things like the Eucharist. So they wanted to say, how are we going to pray to her correctly? Uh, she is not on the same level as Jesus. That we pray to Mary, but she is not our Redeemer, huh? No. That she is not our Savior. No. She intercedes for us like all the saints do. And that's different than being the Savior or the mediator. She's just a mediator of God's grace. That's what she is. That Christ is the one who saves us. And that we are saved in this body of the church. And then they spoke about Mary, that she is the sign of hope as we journey home in this church. Because Mary was everything that we are now. She knew what it was to be born. She knew what it was to be poor. Everybody was poor. She knew what it was to go hungry. She knew what it was to be sad. And because of the special grace given her in light of what she would do for Jesus, only she is the one who was taken at the moment of her death where we one day hope to be with her into heaven, huh? So they said, Mary was once what we are now. Just like us. Huh? Had to go home and do the dishes, you know. Had to clean the house. Had to go grocery shopping in Nazareth and Bethlehem. She had to do all that stuff. She had to put up with her son when he wasn't misbehaving, got lost in the temple. But Mary is now, the church said, what we hope to be. And everybody knows on Armory Street in Springfield, that church that's closed, the name of it is Our Lady of Hope. Huh? And as Christians, we pray to Mary, huh? Mary, Our Lady of Hope, Esperanza. 
She's a great lady of hope for all of us. So this is the document that we look at with Mary, the sign of hope for all the people of God. So when we look at these documents, some important points. That Mary is not only the mother of the Son of God, but like I just said, she is the mother of all of us. And she plays a very special role in the history of salvation. As far back as the prophet Isaiah, Mary will come. And she enjoys a special, unique relationship with Jesus and the church. All of the graces that Mary has come from and point to Christ. Then we have, no matter how many titles we give to Mary, Christ is the sole mediator. Okay? We pray to Jesus through Mary. Okay? We don't pray directly to Mary, we're praying to Jesus through her. And when we pray to her directly, it's asking her to pray for us to Christ. And the church imitates the motherly love of Mary who loved her son as a mother. That we are the benefactors of that. And so she's a sign of hope to all of us on our journey home to heaven. That she was once what we are now. Had to go home and do the dishes, had to go grocery shopping, had to worry about her kids. And she is now what we one day hope to be. And that's a beautiful thought, huh? That she's there waiting for us, saying, I want you to have what I have, to be body and soul assumed on the day of the resurrection into heaven, our resurrection. She's gone before us to show us the way. So, I don't know if anybody needs the English, but they'll be there when you get the slides. So, before I move on with that, any questions? Any questions? Does it all make sense to you? Can I go too fast? Okay. Let's take a break, and we're going to just say, I'm going to show you something at a break, and I'll let you stand up if you need to use the bathroom. But, as I told you, I was in Polio for three years, four years almost, and we did the merger of those three churches. And the way we celebrate the merger at the end is not just by the bishop signing some paper and sending it off to Rome, saying these churches are now one, which he has to do. But the way we celebrate as Catholics, we want to celebrate something important. How do we celebrate? We celebrate at Mass, huh? That's the most important thing. And when we come to Mass, we're going to be talking about that in the second part of this presentation, we do all sorts of wonderful things together. We sing, we light candles like you do at home on your table because having a party. We get nice flowers. People get dressed up. It's not like going to McDonald's fly through, huh? That's there to celebrate, huh? We listen to God's word, we listen to our family story. And that's what we did with the merger of these three parishes that many of you are familiar with because some of you were there or people you knew were there. So I'm just going to end this and show you another little show here. Uh, it celebrates a very, very special day. And that's Sister Jane. I don't know if you know her. This is the day of the match. Two years ago.
Pasada, el, el, la semana pasada, el primer día de clase. Exacto, yo lo hice por Zoom. Me preguntamos si tienen más. Oh, a, eh, a la. ¿Qué me llamas? Lucía. 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 Okay. Ella te puede ver. Okay. Yo creo que ya está abajo. Si, si no está abajo, si no está abajo, le puedes preguntar a, a Rivera. Ok, me puedes dar el libro para enseñar. Gracias. 